Hey, everybody. Good evening. <coughs> Look, I know you're all really excited to be back, and there is um, definitely a motion about the House, not the House of Representatives, our House. Um, so it's, um, it's really a delight uh, to see so many people here tonight, and it's an equal pleasure uh, to welcome you all back to our first lecture of the spring semester. Students and faculty, I hope you all had a very restful and restorative break and you're ready to get back to work. It gives me enormous pleasure to introduce Mabel Wilson as the first speaker of the spring lecture series. She is with us this semester as the Aero Saarinen Visiting Professor of Architecture. The Saarinen Visiting Professorship was created in 1984, so a long time ago, uh, thanks to a generous gift from Kevin Roach after he won the Pritzker Prize. More than 50 accomplished architects have held the position, including Richard Rogers, Frank Gehry, Denise Scott Brown, and Robert Venturi, Toshiko Mori, and Deborah Sant. It is an honor for us to be able to add Mabel Wilson to this list. Mabel Wilson is based at Columbia University, where she is the Nancy and George Rupp Professor of Architecture Planning and Preservation, a professor in the African American and African Diasporic Studies area, and director of the Institute for Research in African American Studies, and alongside Professor Mario Gooden, is the co-director of the Global Africa Lab. Professor Wilson received a Bachelor of Science in Architecture from the University of Virginia, a Master's of Architecture from Columbia University, and a PhD in American Studies from NYU. This makes me proud. Mabel Wilson is an architect. And I think that's important. I really do think that's important. Her objects and larger installations have been displayed at many design institutions, including the Wexner Center for the Arts, the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, and the Storefront for Art and Architecture. And her project with Paul Karyuk, the Away Station, has been acquired by SF MoMA for their permanent collection. Wilson is also a founding member of Who Builds Your Architecture, an important ongoing project that examines quote, the links between labor architecture, construction technology, and the global networks that form around building buildings. In that vein, her studio this semester will be supported by work prepared in last fall's seminar here at Yale, taught jointly with the University of Michigan, exploring issues of forced labor in the built environment. In 2021, Wilson co-organized the Reconstructions, Architecture, and Blackness in America exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. It is the first exhibition at MoMA to feature a collective body of work by 10 African-American architects, artists, designers, et cetera, all working in the public realm. I assume many of you saw the show. It was absolutely spectacular, and the first time in my lifetime as a New Yorker that the crowd at MoMA actually looked like New York, which was great. Um, and it was very much what the city and the museum and all of us needed during that particular stage of the pandemic. Mabel Wilson is an accomplished writer as well. Her books include Race and Modern Architecture, A Critical History from the Enlightenment to the Present, which she co-edited with Irene Chang and Charles Davis. Begin with the Past, Building the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and Negro Building, Black Americans in the World of Fairs and Museums. And she's also published numerous, numerous articles, excuse me, in scholarly journals. Her work in all its forms has been widely recognized. She received the 2019 American Academy of Arts and Letters Award in Architecture and the Educator Mentor Honor from Architectural Record Women in Architecture Design Leadership Program. She was a United States Artist Ford Fellow in Architecture and Design and an Elsa Mellon Bruce Senior Fellow at the National Gallery of Arts Center for Advanced Studies in the Visual Arts. And she is a Fellow of the Society of Architectural Historians. Please join me in welcoming Mabel Wilson for her lecture entitled, Can We Forget? It's a real pleasure to be here um, with longtime uh, friends and colleagues. Uh, also, you know, uh, it was great to meet a lot of the um, students today, uh, I'm very much looking forward to being here um, weekly with you all and um, just, just very excited uh, in terms of spending, spending time here. 
so I just want to thank everyone, um, uh, uh, Dean, Associate Dean Fald and Bernstein, uh, Richard, AJ, and everyone who made um, uh, today uh, possible. So I'm going to get started. And I apologize, I have a slight cold, so I think my voice is going to hold up, but um, I, I'm going to have to take breaks for water. Okay. So, striations, hammering, gashes, names, peers. The lecture I'm going to give today will offer a reflection on the materiality and monumentality of the European arts of building, that is architecture, and its monuments. It will unpack the many ways the memorial to enslaved laborers at the University of Virginia tests the limits, tests the edges of the forms and gestures of a commemoration for what cannot be remembered and for whom we cannot know. Perhaps it's through its modalities of mark making that we constructed what geographer Catherine McKittrick imagines as a, quote, totally different system of geographic knowledge that cannot replicate subordination precisely because it is born of and holds on to the unknowable. Quote. No, we have not forgotten. So two years after emancipation and the end of the Civil War, Isabella Gibbons, a school teacher at the newly created Freedmen School in Charlottesville, Virginia, penned a letter in the March issue of the Boston Daith Monthly, The Freedmen's Record. See page here. In her short but informative letter, Gibbons provided a forceful corrective to white Southerners' projection that their former holdings in human property enslaved families like Gibbons, her husband William, and their children thought of their former masters and mistresses with great affection, even longing. Now in her letter, Gibbons noted that white Southerner, Southern, so, Southerners believed that Yankees were turning newly emancipated African Americans against, against them, even though from their perspective, many of their former slaves harbored no ill will. Now Gibbons in her letter derided these former enslavers' grandiose misperceptions by writing, quote, and she's saying this very sarcastically, most of them love us and have forgotten what happened while they were slaves. They know we are their friends, unquote. It was Gibbon's mission to put what she labeled as this grand story to rest by recounting her and her community's recollection of enslavement. This is what Isabella Gibbons remembers, quote, can we forget the crack of the whip, cowhide, whipping post, the auction block, the handcuffs, the spaniels, the iron collar, the Negro trader tearing the young child from its mother's breast as a whelp from the lioness? Have we forgotten by these horrible cruelties Hundreds of our race have been killed. No, we have not, or ever will. Quote. Now, Gibbons probably recognized all too well that white supremacy had not relented in the Piedmont region of Virginia, nor elsewhere in the American South. She was probably witness to how her fellow uh, Southern citizens were whitewashing history by conjuring a noble lost cause while obstructing the progress of reconstruction that siphoned off all money, monetary and material aid and impeded black franchise at the ballot box. And in fact, how white Southerners were constituting a new regime of racial violence out of the remnants of slavery's tactics of deadly intimidation appeared in the letter that was printed above Gibbons in the Freedman's Record, in which a white teacher, Sidney Busby, recounts how their Freedman School near Raleigh, North Carolina, was first riddled with bullets and then burned to the ground. 
This was in part because he had dared report, quote, certain murders that had been perpetrated in Snow Hill, end quote. Busby fled to Raleigh in fear. And yet, in the face of this terror and death, Gibbons remained committed to educating the children and adults as a means of repairing the dehumanizing psychic and material conditions wrought by centuries of enslavement. But there is more to her story. Now here we see Gibbons in an undated photograph in the collection of the Boston Public Library. She learned to read and write while enslaved, which made her, once free, an ideal teacher within the Freedmen's School Network. Her dress, with its embellishments, declare her status as a member of the nascent black middle class. Her hand resting on a book signifies her profession as an educator. Now, standing in stark contrast to the iron, the cold iron, and stinging leather materials that had populated the arsenal ensuring her enslavement, an elegant dangling neck piece that may have been a watch clasped to the flowing folds of Gibbon's dress. Time was now hers to claim, and it was hers to narrate. Gibbon's recollection shared in the Freedmen's record indicated that she had not forgotten those horrible cruelties. Now, it is believed that Gibbons taught herself to read and write, a skill punishable by be beating or even death, after she arrived at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville around 1850. We don't know the exact date she arrived. Now, she was purchased by a professor of natural philosophy, William Barton Rogers, who eventually left the school for Boston to be a founder of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. Now, Gibbons served as the family cook in Pavilion 6. As real property that could be entailed or sold with the house and land, Gibbons thus continued these duties enslaved by other professorial families until she, her husband William, a servant also enslaved by a UVA professor, and their children were emancipated in March of 1865 with the arrival of Union troops to Charlottesville. Now where Gibbons labored was part of an ensemble of buildings that comprised the University of Virginia. When it opened in 1826, UVA's 10 pavilions housed faculty and family, its lawn rooms boarded 125 white male students, and the verdant swath of the terrace lawn was crowned by the rotunda, the centerpiece of the ensemble that housed the library. In his plans for the academical village, Thomas Jefferson, signer of the Declaration of Independence, the second governor of Virginia, the third president of the US, lawyer, surveyor, plantation owner, and owner of 600 enslaved people over the course of his life, wrote in a letter that a modern American university should bring together an exclusive community in an environment designed to be conducive to, quote, to health, to study, to manners, morals, and orders. End quote. Now, while in Jefferson's educational Eden, its white residents embarked on a daily journey of personal enlightenment and communal engagement whose material needs were satisfied by the labor of slaves, for the enslaved, their daily routine unfolded under the regulatory authority of slave codes that severely curtailed mobility and basic freedoms of family and assembly. For example, enslaved workers, many of them boys, fabricated and fired the 1.2 million bricks for the rotunda. In his design for UVA, Jefferson carefully calibrated vistas throughout the grounds to strategically hide from view the spaces where slaves labored. The careful terracing of the lawn in section allowed Jefferson to design pavilions that were two stories on the lawn side, which is what you see here, and three stories on the garden side, creating a lower level walkout basement, which housed spaces for the labor of the enslaved. So slaves like Gibbons and her husband 
worked in poorly illuminated kitchens, and lived in quarters below the pavilion. Behind each pavilion, they worked inside the snaking serpentine walls, the famous serpentine walls, where the wash and smoke houses and other dependencies could be found. They were act they're actually much taller then than they actually are now. Now one could say that Jefferson understood slavery to be abhorrent, and he employed architecture in the architectural section to conceal it. Much in the same way he buries the dependencies at Monticello below ground. So even within the idyllic academical village, the enslaved lived under the constant threat of violence at any time from any white person, faculty, students, hotel owners, university administrators, visitors, on or off grounds that ensured unyielding obedience and compliance. So note that circle sort of on the widow's walk of Pavilion 9. So what had been rendered silent in the official historical narratives about the university's antebellum period from 1817 to 1865 was mention of the academical village's dependency on an equal number, roughly 150 at one time, enslaved men, women, and children. That history hid in plain sight for about 155 years, as seen here rendered in a cartouche from a famous 1827 map of Virginia. And this cartouche shows an enslaved woman caring for the white child of a professor, professor on the widow's walk of Pavilion 9. <coughs> Now, as a founding father, Jefferson's likeness and accomplishments are exalted in thousands of monuments around the US, like this bronze Beaux-Arts statue by Moses Ezekiel, sited on the north side of the rotunda. This was roughly at the beginning of the 20th century, so you can see it's got all of these like Beaux-Arts flourishes um, in them. Now, a polymath, naturalist, and an enlightenment man of letters, Thomas Jefferson understood the power of recollection all too well. Now, when he took stock of the burgeoning nation and his state of Virginia, in his 1785 notes on his state of Virginia, he speculated in that text that, quote, deep-rooted prejudices entertained by the whites, 10,000 recollections by the blacks of the injuries that they have sustained will divide us into parties and produce convulsions which will never end but in the extermination of the one or the other race." Quote. Now Jefferson outlines and notes his proposed resolution to this prospect of slave insurrection and also white moral decay, which was the incremental emancipation of America's enslaved population. Once liberated Negroes would be once liberated, Negroes would be denied citizenship and transported outside the bounds of the US to settle in indigenous lands in the West or in the Caribbean or in Africa. Citing 10,000 recollections, Jefferson understood from his own life as a slaveholder that the routine violence that maintained submission would, quote, never be forgotten, end quote, by those enslaved like Isabella Gibbons. Now, today, the spectacle of racial violence continues to remain central to how white supremacy asserts its public pres presence. Now, in August of 2017, this Jefferson statue on the North Plaza of the Rotunda became a gathering point for a group of 100 mostly white men who led a torch-lit parade through the university's historic grounds, a kind of ominous reenactment of Ku Klux Klan night marches. Now, members of white nationalist groups had descended on Charlottesville to protest the city government's removal of Confederate, the, the monuments to Confederate generals Robert E. Lee and Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson in downtown Charlottesville. Now, while alternating cries of, you will not replace us, Jews will not replace us, and white lives matter, the throngs of white nationalists encircled a smaller group of anti-racist protesters at the base of Ezekiel's Jefferson statue. Now Jefferson, 
who in his lifetime had been a vociferous, champ vociferous champion of freedom for white Euro-Americans, had lacked the political and personal will to end chattel slavery, which would have freed thousands of enslaved blacks, including hundreds of his own slaves. Jefferson's visage became a flashpoint for both the condemnation and exaltation of the white nationalist ideals constitutive to the nation's founding and prosperity. Now, as a counter protest to the white supremacist march, one month later, in September of 2017, dozens of protesters, a group that included students and faculty and local residents, engaged in an act of civil disobedience by wrapping this figure of Jefferson in black plastic and draping a Black Lives Matter, fuck white supremacy banner at the statue's marble base. The demonstration proclaimed solidarity with local residents in response to the violent and deadly white nationalist march that had taken place one month earlier and left one anti-racist protester, Heather Heyer, dead. What these protesters demanded was for the university's administration to renounce the institution's historical connections with racist individuals and groups by, for example, removing two Confederate memorial plaques affixed to the rotunda's south entrance. They called this a march to reclaim our grounds. But it was also an effort to excise the haunting reminders of white supremacy from the everyday spaces traversed by students, staff, faculty, and visitors. And now here we see the Lee statue in downtown Charlottesville as it was surrounded by police in tactical gear in August of 2017. I mean, it was, many of you know this thing, it was finally removed um, about uh, a year and a half ago, two years ago. Now from its inception as a nation in the 18th century, White Americans have deployed monuments to territorialize white supremacy through representations of ideal character, physiques, and events of historical significance. The proliferation of Confederate monuments to a fictive lost cause encapsulates this practice par excellence. Now these 4,000 Confederate monuments are also American monuments, reflective of shared values erected by American citizens in America's public spaces. Yes, they're called Confederate monuments, but those were put in place by Americans in American cities and towns. So from its inception as a nation in the 18th century, white Americans have deployed these monuments, right? Um, the, some, these symbolic expressions have demarcated where black residents under Jim Crow prohibitions could or could not venture, both a psychical and physical space of racial terror. Territorial markers like these worked in concert with racial assemblages of urban space, substandard housing, segregated public amenities, racial violence, and law enforcement to diminish the prospects of black life. So the memorial landscape of Charlottesville provided fertile, fer fertile if not difficult ground to consider this racialized dynamic found in many US cities and towns. The requisite expression of figuration and names and historical citations of monuments and memorials are deeply entangled with how whiteness historicizes and territorializes its power. One of the many forms of dominant, violent domination that Gibbons so painfully recalls in her recollection of a life enslaved. And therefore, when remembering slavery in places like UVA, how does one reckon, reckon with the racialized forms of its very address foundational to the Western monument form? So UVA's history of slavery remained buried until the 2000s, when student protests at the university demanded that the president and board of visitors acknowledged the enslaved community that built and maintained the lives of all those at UVA. So students, you have power, 
you should exercise it. So in 2007, UVA's Board of Visitors authorized the installation of a plaque, this plaque, in the floor of the walkway in front of the rotunda on the south side, co-equal with the recognition that they gave to the white craftsmen and builders who worked at the university. However, this plaque had the unintended consequence of sparking more student outrage from another group of students because it invisibilized the presence of the enslaved workers like Isabella Gibbons, who continued to labor after the completion of construction, and those who lived and worked at the university until 1865. So in 2012, UVA students demanded that the university erect a more visible memorial to enslaved laborers on its grounds. Now this hidden history became even more tangible to the community when archeologists discovered 70 unmarked graves of enslaved workers behind the university's official cemetery. In 2014, a ceremony of memorialization that began at the community and ended in the cemetery recognized those lives. And so this is what you see here. So how does one build places for remembering, suturing together the past from the archives and sites of slavery, which nonetheless bears the traces of physical, epistemic, and ontological violence of enslavement? So in 2016, I joined with architects Nijin Yoon and Eric Howler, seen here, activist, conflict mediator, and UVA professor, Frank Duke, seen all the way on your right, uh, and Charlottesville landscape architect Greg Bleem to win the commission to design the memorial to enslaved laborers at UVA, which was an idea conceived by students in 2012. Seen here uh, at Montpelier, which is James Madison's home, is Frank with Brooklyn-based artist Eto Otitigbe, who joined our team a year later in 2017. And I must say, ours was a rich collaboration of designers, artists, and scholars. And so we were really the kind of core uh, team um, for the project. And it was an unusual project, which could be your worst nightmare, or an amazing opportunity because the university had no site, had no program, had no budget. Um, and so they essentially hired us because we would help them ask questions and really open up a public dialogue about, about what is possible. Um, and so um, we started this in October of 2016. And so to engage Charlottesville fraught commemorative landscape, we not only had to design a memorial, but also integral to that process was to design a community engagement process that included a survey, meetings in community spaces, as you see here. We had community ambassadors um, to build dialogue, understanding, but most importantly, trust. Crucial to these convenings were that they be forums of acknowledgement and that we listen and that people feel that they were heard. We open dialogues mindful of the history of mistrust and suspicion that many harbored against an institution that they referred to as the plantation, in part because of its treatment of workers today and its incremental gentrification of nearby black neighborhoods, which elevate the cost of housing above what is affordable by locals, right? And so I think one of the things that we brought up was that this was not about past history. We, this is the wake of slavery and these issues are still relevant. And so from our various meetings, what we heard was that the memorial needed to tell the unvarnished truth about the past to have any legitimacy, that it needed to bring the community together to both learn and reflect on that history, and that the memorial needed to express dualities, not only pain and suffering, but also the resilience, dignity, and the humanity of those who were enslaved. And lastly, it needed to be a living memorial, an ongoing memorial to acknowledge that the work of this commemorative landscape remains incomplete in the wake of slavery. 
So along with collecting aspirations and public forums and online, hearing about design, the desired meanings and experiences, and the stories that needed to be told by the memorial, we also did extensive research in black traditions and spaces of gathering. We also wanted to honor a request from the Memorial to Enslaved Laborer, Mel, as they were called, student group, who had catalyzed the memorial project and who wanted a space of gathering that was very important for them. So as part of our design process, we looked for cultural forms and rituals that could be translated into our design and hush harbors, we thought about baptismal rituals, we looked at artworks by people like Alma Thomas and others. We explored, for example, what you're seeing here, ring shouts, which is a low country, that's South Carolina, Georgia, uh, ecstatic dance whose performers move in a circle and whose rhythms and movements connect to West African practices. Circular forms like the ring shout, a Brooklyn Chaco, became relevant references for us. So we designed the memorial as a series of nested rings fabricated in Virginia Miss granite from a nearby quarry in Culpeper, Virginia. And little did we know that Virginia Miss was actually, there's a upper level on the rotunda uh, that's also used for the paving. So it was already, we could make the argument because they're very finicky about materials, uh, that this was actually a local material already in place. So as you can see in the diagram, the center holds a gathering space, a lawn. This is inscribed by an inner ring which holds a timeline of historical events. The next layer of the ring creates a concave surface of remembrance, and then the outer convex surface creates a canvas for expression, and each of these rings speaks to a different layer of history, meaning, and interpretation. And you can sort of see the relationship um, uh, to the rotunda. It has a diameter of 80 feet, which is exactly the same dimension of the rotunda, but whereas the rotunda is a kind of closed space, this is an open ended circle. It's actually a broken circle. So it opens out um, into, into um, the landscape. And the memorial is oriented northward. The path that you see to the left lays out a path to liberation, a step for each of the 48 years, peoples who were enslaved lived and worked at UVA. So once we marked a place for the memorial in our design process, and that was tricky, you know, we had um, three sites that we ended up focusing on, one at the end of the lawn, at the ends of Pavilion 9 and 10. There was another site where one of Jefferson's buildings, which was the anatomical theater, had been taken down. It was the only building of Jefferson's that was actually demolished. And then there was the area that you just saw, the Triangle of Grass. And so that's where we landed the, the project because it sort of, it seemed that it had enough scale. It was open. It was still part of the UNESCO heritage site. But also more importantly, it was accessible by the public from the people coming from Charlottesville in ways that the other, again, because of distrust, feeling that they might be harassed, was not accessible if we placed it further into the area of the lawn or the university. And so we marked a place for the memorial. Once we did that, our mark making shifted to the naming of names, to the marking of time, both challenging the tasks of the monument when one engages the archives of slavery. Which is as Saidiya Hartman reminds us, quote, she says, I want to tell the story about two girls capable of retrieving what remains dormant the purchase or claim of their lives on the present without committing further violence in my own active, active narration. It is a story predicated upon impossibility, listening for the unsaid, translating misconstrued words, and refashioning disfigured lives, an intent on achieving an impossible goal, redressing the violence that produced the numbers, ciphers, and fragments of discourse, which is as close as we can become, come to a biography of the captive and the enslaved. And so this is from Saidiya's essay, Venus in Two Acts. Therefore, how might we build spaces that remember from these archives and sites of slavery? Paraphrasing Hartman, can we retrieve 
in the memorial for UVA's enslaved community what remains dormant, the purchase or claim of their lives on the present without committing further violence in our own act of architectural and spatial narration of the past. Unknown, unknown. So to develop the layers of history in the memorial, we worked closely with an amazing group of committed historians whose thoughtful examination of UVA's enslaved community and the history of, the, of slavery at the university provided incredibly rich material. They were really a, 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 just an astonishing um, uh, group. So to name names, to tell the story of the enslaved community required that we engage with an archive of work ledgers and personal letters of slave owners, and as such, it is an archive of daily life, one laced with silences and one that is haunted by violence. So the archive, for example, yielded the following examples. 1820, Rhoda, last name unknown. UVA rents Negro named Rhoda from the state for 18, uh, in 1820 uh, for $20. X writes, quote, I'm truly sorry for Rhoda's illness and I'm afraid by this she must be dead. Her son Winston comes up to see what has become of her. If she is alive, I will thank you to inform him of the state of her case, end quote. 1825, black woman, last name unknown. Letter commenting on the death of, quote, one of Mr. X's black women from typhoid fever, end quote. 1836, first name unknown, last name unknown. A woman. 1843, Harriet, last name unknown, X to X mentions enslaved woman Harriet, who was, quote, troublesome, end quote, and is now rented out for $10 in the country. So in our ledger, a digital spreadsheet, um, these 311 unknown unknown were denoted as blacks or colored ladies or four Negroes, servants, runaway, or as you can see here, extra hands at Christmas. So we found 311 mentions like that. So historians estimate that 4,000 men, women, and children built, labored, and lived at UVA. But we know very little about the details of their, their life. So how does one represent the unknown unknowns where archival erasure continued the violence of racial capital's calibration of a life turned into a thing. So as the spreadsheet on the right shows, we found 889 persons. And for a handful of people like Isabella Gibbons, Sally Cottrell, Thrimston Hearn, Henry Martin, we know full names, first names and last names, but those are less than 20. Of those 889 references, we know mostly the first names of 577 community members. And then as I mentioned, for the remaining 311 recorded unknown persons, we used kinship relationships and occupations to remember their lives. And so that's the total of 4,000 people, 3,111 of them are unknown. And so because we organized our spreadsheet by date, first name, last name, and historic details, we learned a lot of this from these work ledgers of white bookkeepers, supervisors, and slave owners, from the letters penned by white students and professors and wives, and from the wills listing estate property. The list became a technique of modern bureaucratic documentation seen on monuments, remembering, for example, the victims of genocide, or the list you see honoring fallen soldiers, like the two plaques dedicated to the Confederate traitors, that the protesters demanded that the university remove from the south entrance of the rotunda. So in the early renderings of the project, prior to archival study, we had imagined that we would list their names in vertical columns onto the memorial concave interior surface. And so it was just a kind of knee-jerk reaction, we're gonna list the names vertically. But how could we avoid the archival residences of Gibbon's horrible cruelties by retaining the list as a form of remembrance common to the Western Monument. So what if we instead refused legibility, literally the ledger? So as you walk into the memorial, you become enveloped by what we call a genealogical cloud of names and marks and social 
relations. And arrayed across this surface is the story, albeit a fragmented one, of a community. Right, and this gives you a sense of that detail. And so, given the fact that the list of names are traditional features of Western memorials, and given that our archive, what the archive we had, we had to reimagine social relations and rehumanize the experiences of the enslaved. And so, as a result, visitors engage Henry and Isabella Gibbons and Jane and Jack, Roberti and Randall as families of sisters and grandmothers, uncles and friends, as workers who took pride in their work as woodcutters and janitors, laundresses, and fiddlers. There's actually one fiddler in the entire arc. And we also carved into the granite 4,000 gashes, or what we called memory marks, including a mark for every unknown unknown that records the violence of the erasure of the name. And sometimes these marks speak back, sometimes with tears, to their descendants and to us. And so we had no idea that each of those gashes would actually retain the water um, and then sort of drip. And so there's this sense that the wall is, in fact, a kind of weeping. It was something that was unknown. And so each memory mark holds the possibility of descendants connecting to their family, right? And so you can kind of get a sense of the, the arc of the wall and then, you know, the number, there are 4,000 of those all the way across the surface. And so, this did indeed happen in January of 2021 with the inscriptions of names of the members of Thrimpston Hearn's family. So each memory mark is sort of awaiting the possibility of a name, and so we imagine that there might be, and actually there were, names that then reappear through families, through genealogical work, and so we can add names to the memorial. So along with naming names, a narrative of events and the representations of figures are also integral to the Western memorial form. So in the memorial, the community of names that you see on the left appears across from a bench with a timeline and a water feature that captures the attention of visitors who learn a very different history of the university. And so in contrast to the wall of marks and names which rises and inclines outward, a shallow near-level water table shares with visitors the history of enslavement at the university. The 70 historical entries inscribed into the water table begins with the arrival of the enslaved to Virginia in 1619 and ends with the passing of Isabella Gibbon in 1890. The timeline also covers the arrival of 10 enslaved laborers to clear the land that would become UVA, and this happens in 1817. And the timeline covers a history of transactions, work, regulation, and violence. So as you can see on the right, a steady stream of shallow water washes over the entire arc of the timeline to reference libation rituals and the currents of rivers that might have carried people to freedom. So here you see um, an example of, of some of the uh, inscriptions um, uh, in the timeline. So when the university's Board of Visitors imagined a historical timeline, I think they envisioned that it would contain entries following the larger campus-wide commemorative tradition of proselytizing Jefferson's democratic values. However, much to their chagrin, which got the design team and our collaborators in some hot water, we created a timeline that centered the experience of the enslaved community, juxtaposing lives where people learned and loved within a landscape of toil, tyranny, and trauma. So you could see here, for example, 1850, three students attack a 12-year-old enslaved girl in a field near UVA. The students are expelled. 1853, Isabella Gibbons, a cook who works in a pavilion kitchen, marries William Gibbons, a butler enslaved by another UVA professor. They teach themselves to read and write. 
And so Isabella Gibbons is the only member of this enslaved community, an estimated 4,000, from which the archives have yielded a full name. We don't know when she was born, but we do know her date of death, a photograph, and a brief written record of her experiences. And so she serves as the witness for her community, and her remembrance published in the Freedman's Record concludes the historical timeline. So that's the quote that I read at the beginning that is at the end of this timeline. So when you hold these public meetings, <laughs> people got ideas. <laughs> and one of the meetings that we had, we were so happy. We had figured out where we were going to cite it. We had this beautiful abstract form. And people were like, I don't get it. It's this white model. There's this big circle. It does not speak to me. And they were like, we want bronze figures. We want to see people. And um, we were not going that route in this project. <laughs> And yet, there's this question of the figure, right? Because the figuration is, a part, again, it's, it's the timeline. We want dates. We want names. We want the figures, right? So addressing the question of figuration, in what ways can we render the unknown, right? And so we became intrigued by the powerful artistry of Eto, Eto Ototigbe. And we were interested in his explorations of scarring and scarification, visibility and invisibility. And so for Africans, and also for African Americans, and blacks in the diaspora, the scar can either be a trace of violence, of a whip, or it could be a mark of beauty and belonging, as in ritualistic scarification, scarification. So in this piece, Becoming Visible, Eyes on Me, Looking Out, Looking Up, is Edo's meditation on how blackness marked him and Trayvon Martin as simultaneously hyper-visible and dangerous, and invisible and not human. And we were interested in that unstable perce perception that he renders in what is a lenticular technique that flickers between appearance and disappearance. And so you can get a sense that, depending on how you approach it, sometimes his eyes are open, sometimes his eyes are closed. And it's done through a kind of lenticular cutting of the surface. I think this was a kind of MDF board. And so flickering between appearance and disappearance evades legibility and hence no ability. And so we invited Eto to join the team to create an artwork for the memorial's outward facing surface. And so Eto became interested in layering the information we had gleaned from our conversations and historic sites and archives, such as rare photographs of people enslaved at UVA, like Isabella Gibbons. He was also interested in things like these rough tombstones from the daughter of Zion African American burial ground and also things like the vertical quarry marks in stone that would have been worked by skilled black masons that would have built parts of uh, and maintained parts of UVA. And so these traces mark the presence of black labor that is typically rendered invisible and or veiled by their blackness, but especially the labor of black women like Gibbons whose subjectivity, as Hortense Spiller reminds us, invokes an impossibility of representation and being into the onto episteme of the West. Right? And so we became interested in you know, Isabella Gibbons' eyes. And so Eto, our design team, our, we had amazing collaboration, collaborators in the Office of Architects at, at, at UVA. They were really phenomenal. Um, all of us collectively worked with Quora Stone, which is based in, in Madison, Wisconsin, on the fabric. They fabricated the memorial. And what was developed was a custom parametric carving technique. So it was basically scaling up that technique um, that Eto had developed. Uh, and it was used to make um, an image visible through the linear carving of stone by manipulating the depth of carving and to render the image visible from certain vantage points. So you could see the image, and then the image was translated into vertical striations, overlaid onto a bush hammering pattern that you could see actually in that tombstone. And then together, they produce this effect. And I'll show you what it does. So this is what it is. So these are the eyes of Isabella Gibbons. And so carved out of Virginia Miss Granite by a computerized fabrication process, rather than figured in molten bronze, are Isabella Gibbons' eyes. 
So as visitors propose, approach the memorial, her eyes appear or disappear based on the mood of the sky and the approach of the body. You don't always see this. So we honor Gibbons as the witness for and watcher of a community bringing their lives known and unknown to ours. Now the dedication of the memorial was scheduled to take place in April of 2020. But like life for everyone, COVID preempted a formal gathering. So in June of 2020, when construction crews removed the, the construction fence, the memorial was nonetheless informally dedicated. They had basically laid the sod. Um, what you see here is the medical school, White Coats for Black Lives, who organized a protest at the memorial. The group of doctors and medical students took a knee for eight minutes and 49 seconds in remembrance of the murder of George Floyd, a gruesome reminder of the violence and injustices that persist in slavery's wake. So if there was repair or reparation, so to speak, it was with a reunion of descendants with their ancestors who lived and worked and died on the grounds of UVA. And the university actually hired a genealogist to begin to trace some of the names that we have been able to uncover. And many of the people actually are related or related to descendants of Monticello because when Jefferson died, he was very much in debt and they sold a number of the enslaved community to professors at UVA. And so there's this very interesting connection also with that descendant community that the Monticello Foundation has been working on for many years. Um, and so what you see is a descendant dedication in April of 2020. So the actual dedication happened a year later uh, in, in 2021. And so you could say that Gibbons understood the grand story of history as always weaponized against the African in the diaspora. That is why she wrote down and published her recollection of slavery. The terror of white supremacy that Gibbons recalled was not unique, nor was it confined to the institution of slavery. She knew, Jefferson knew, we all know. So to conclude, the Memorial for Enslaved Laborers at UVA came into fruition through a collective desire to face the past, to reckon with the truths, including the horrible cruelties, as Gibbons' quote on the timeline describes. For the design team, the memorial form, a representational medium of monumentality, signifying whiteness and masculinity and the state, had to be dematerialized to make a space for communion and community. We strove to create a memorial that abandoned grand stories, but instead employed different modes of image and mark making to tell and also not tell situated and fragmented narratives of a community's loss, its perseverance, and its possibility for those who gather and seek to remember. Practices of careful listening and thoughtful dialogue underwrote our design process in an effort to rehumanize these 4,000 people and to connect them to their descendants and to us. Perhaps rather than be made evident through the scant, violent details of the archival ledger, letter, or will, the rich, complex lives of this community unfolds in part in the ephemeral and haptic mark making throughout the memorial, as well as in the imagination of descendants and visitors, a multiplicity of future memories not yet known. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mabel is happy to answer questions. We have time for a few questions. Are there any questions out there? Hi, thank you so much for the lecture. I'm interested in the distribution of the gashes on the inside of the memorial. Um, how were those kind of positioned or um, you know, scattered across that surface and are the names or the you know, um, words denoting the people who we don't know about, are they temporally organized or are they organized by supposed social arrangements or um, <coughs> also like the length of the gashes. There's a lot of variables there that I think are really interesting. 
<coughs> Excuse me. Um, the gashes were determined by, well, one, the longest name that we had, right? So, th so that kind of gave us a, a metric. Um, and there is a distribution, and I can't remember, I think there are three or four different lengths of them. So they are distributed in different lengths across the, uh, the surface. And as you can see, above some of the gashes you get first names, first name, last name, occupation, or kinship, right? Um, and so those are kind of distribute. They're not exactly, the names aren't exactly chronological order. They're kind of loosely chronologically ordered. Um, you know, the spreadsheets were very tricky in the sense that um, it was difficult sometimes to tell if Sam in 1840 is the same Sam in 1832, right? And so we really had to very carefully sort of parse what names we were trying to include or not include or presume that it was not the same, per or it was the same person. So it, it was tricky, I mean, because there was so much that, that, that we didn't know uh, as well. But it, you know, it was interesting when they found these descendants of Thurmston Thurm Hearn, who I believe was, was actually owned by, by, by Jefferson. Now that the family knows the name is there, they said, wait, all of these other people were here. It was a question of putting their names on the memory marks that were long enough. But we had distributed enough of them, I think, for it to, to actually work. Um, but we were amazed at how quickly, you know, within less than a year, you know, here, here were these names that were, were coming up. We don't expect that many, but I think doing the kind of genealogical work that they've been doing, um, uh, they, they are starting to, to find more people, which is interesting. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Mabel, I wait, for, wait for the microphone. Oh, the mic is coming. <laughs> I wonder, you know, you've touched on the whole issue of memorials, which are static and placed, often without interpretation from the century that we're standing in about what we're looking at. Um, and I just wondered if you could say more about that. Or how, how do you feel the civic dialogue is progressing on the question of removal, reinterpretation, defacement, you know, what, what, what the layering? I, I mean, clearly things have moved. Um, I, who would have thought Monument Avenue in Richmond would ever come down? you know, the capital of the Confederacy, like, but it did. Uh, it's funny because our, um, it was a really great article in the Washington Post, I think, of Devin Henry, who was the uh, contractor actually for us, and, and, and Devin's firm has basically been removing all the, the monuments in, 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 in Richmond. And so surprisingly, like, who would have thought any of that would have come down, or, you know, that they would have removed Jackson and, and, and Lee. So, you know, but it's, it takes time. I mean, that's what's interesting. And that's why I said, you know, the students started with one thing, and then another student, a bunch of students, they were like, yay, we got this plaque. And then another group of students were like, mm-mm, you know? And they're like, this isn't enough, right? And so it, it's, it's amazing. It's never instant. It's, it's really about persistence if you want change. And it's never one group. It's usually, mul you know, from my experience, multiple groups and multiple dialogues. And, and so as a design team, we came into, there was something called the President's Commission to Study Slavery at the university, the PCSU. You know, they had been looking, they had been doing a lot of research already. There's a really great book, Landscapes of Tyranny, by Lewis Nelson, and um, I forgot his co-author, who's an amazing historian. Yes, Maury McGinnis. Um, you know, so these, you know, they had done all of this, this amazing work. So we could plug into that. They had a community outreach group already. So that allowed us, and, and, I, and I think having Frank Dukes on the team, Frank was an integral part of the Blue Ribbon Commission that wrote one of the most amazing reports for the removal of monuments ever. And so Frank had been involved in the activism of removing those, those, those monuments, much better than, I was on a commission in New York City, we didn't even go into the power dynamics, and I think that Blue Ribbon Commission, just, they told the truth, um, and uh, as difficult as it was. And so, so I think it was just that we walked into an already robust group of people, that was. And so when we got the approval by the Board of Visitors, thank God we did, 
that was in, we started in October, we got the approval in June, all hell broke loose in August. So it was already greenlit, the design had been approved. Um, we were just glad we had gotten that before, you know, all, the, all that happened. Um, but again, you know, even at that meeting, I mean, there were community people there were there. I mean, it was just an amazing, it felt like it was a village that really made it happen. Um, and so it was very much a, a collaborative process uh, as well. And, and I think, you know, if you're going to undertake this work, it really, it, it requires a lot of different groups of people working together to, to do that. And I, and I think there has been some progress. There's been a lot of backlash, but there's also been a lot of progress. <clears throat> Uh, I'm just curious as to why you chose that specific like site of of UVA to place your monument and why not somewhere else on campus? Um, well, it was in the um, it was in close proximity to where people lived to to the grounds, you know, to the original grounds of the pavilions, there are ranges on the outside and then there are the pavilions on, on the inside. And so we knew, and the university wanted it somewhere in that vicinity. I think the site that we chose, because it was you know, the triangle of grass, it just gave us scale. Uh, and it also gave us accessibility from the city in ways that had we put it at the end of pavilions nine and 10, it would have been a different scale of a, of, of a memorial. Um, and so the, you know, the land's not flat, it actually has a slight, a slight slope, um, but it allowed us to actually kind of make a space, right? It became spatial as opposed to an object, and you know, that we thought was extremely important. Um, and they think that area might have been an orchard or provision ground that the enslaved might have worked originally. So, so that's part of the reason why we felt that was a really great site. But mostly because people, you know, we were told it's accessible from people from Charlottesville, especially the African Americans that live in the community. They don't feel comfortable going on ground. Okay, good. Mm. Yes, oh, it's coming. Mabel, thank you. Fantastic talk, fantastic memorial in a host of ways. I'm wondering, having done this now, how do you feel about Saeed Hartman's use of the word impossible twice in that quote? Uh, in this act of amazing remembrance, how, how does it make you feel, think now about that word impossible? Um, I still think it was, you know, I mean, it, it, it was a challenge. I mean, to do this kind of work, to remember, to figure out a way of representing the number of people. Um, it, it, it's difficult. And there was, there, I think there's still something about the weight of the granite, the, um, the form itself that still has its limits. And I will say that um, Mija and Eric and I are working on a kind of not response to the memorial, but addressing this question of the unknown unknown, but in very, very, very different way. Um, you know, just without the bureaucracy of the institution and, you know. But for me, it's always been, been a question. But, but I, you know, but I, but I do wonder, when I started to reflect more on what we did, the limits of the monument as a form, precisely because we couldn't know the dates, we couldn't know the people, we couldn't even know their relationships. And so we bumped up against a limit. And so we had to kind of come up with these kind of provisional ways of mark making. Um, we, we were like, no, we're not gonna make these generic bronze figures of people we don't know. But we don't, the only people we knew were like, you know, Sally Cottrell or Henry Mark, you know, or Isabella Gibbons. And so, you know, her eyes and the fact that she appears and disappears, that she's not in molten bronze like Jefferson, you know, up the, walkway, I don't know, there was just something somewhat powerful that it's there but not there. And that's what we feel that there is a sense of absence also in the memorial. But that was the duality that we, we were constantly hearing from when we spoke with people. So I don't know if that, that answers, yeah. Yeah, and it's really only kind of in retro, you know, we're just trying to get the job done. 
But in retrospect, you know, thinking now over this, yeah, I mean, how we made it is a reflection of that problematic, right, of the archive of slavery. Yeah, to follow up on that, you mentioned when you were talking with stakeholders, there was this kind of need or there is this want for this like traditional bronze and mm -hmm. like statuary and this like traditional idea of monument. And when you're dealing with something that's like this kind of charged, how do you sort of bridge that barrier with them and how can you kind of sell them on this need for this anti-monument as opposed to this gleaming bronze statue? Yeah, there was a dude handing out cards at that meeting. Who makes bronze statues? <laughs> I'm not kidding, he's like, I, I'm just up the road in so-and-so Virginia and I'll make you a bronze. I mean, he was literally trying to drum up business at our meeting. Um, but I think it was important, and this is kind of something I learned from Frank Dukes, who's a conflict mediator. It was important to build relationships with people and to have people feel like they were being heard. Um, and that's what people were so pleased about at the meeting at the Board of Visitors, was they felt like there was trust that was opening up and that somehow a dialogue um, was opening with a community that had basically not wanted to be involved with the uh, with, uh, um, university at all. And, 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 you know, and, and building dialogues and building trust, it, it was not easy. I mean, we, you know, even to the literally last meeting, we were supposed to, the landscaping around the memorial was supposed to actually be a grove of trees. And we had planned it as a hush harbor, and there were gonna be these beautiful trees. One, because we wanted it to be a kind of clearing of gathering, that's what the Hush Harbor allowed. Two, it is hot in Virginia in the summer, right? So the trees would have cooled the site down significantly. But it was very interesting that the descendant group, um, who are now a nonprofit, were like, no, we don't want the trees because it feels like the university is trying to hide something. And they were very insistent of not having the trees. And so we had to have a meeting with them trying to persuade them why we wanted the tree. And they were like, no. No trees, so there are no trees. But it was great because that now is in place. There is this nonprofit descendants, you know, that are engaged in the university, which for, for me is an amazing, outcome. even more, again, more so than the memorial, the fact that there is this group of people who are making demands on the university, I just think is phenomenal. Thank you so much for a great lecture. Since we're at Yale, I feel compelled to ask about um, your influence from Maya Lin. Um, I feel like I'm, I see some Vietnam War Memorial and some of the women's table here at Yale in this monument, but of course, in a new light. So I'm wondering if you could talk about what you've learned from Maya Lin and perhaps ways in which you departed from her way of making monuments and, and what you did. Yeah, I mean, it, that's such, such an iconic project, the Vietnam Memorial, so you can't help but you know, kind of respond to it. Um, you know, and her, her work, uh, you know, her sense of materiality, of landscape, of scale is important. You know, we, we looked at, we had an amazing array of different kinds of artists that we were looking at. Some were in landscape, like I was saying, Alma Thomas, who's a painter. Um, you know, we were looking at 19th century paintings. We were looking at sculptures. We were looking at, I mean, we have this huge archive, actually, of stuff that we were looking at to try to, Fred Wilson's another artist we were, we were thinking about. Um, and um, yeah, but you can't, you know, if she's, it's, it's Maya Lin, what are you gonna do? <laughs> but I do think that's important. You know, like your work is never in a vacuum. You're always in dialogue with stuff that's out there. If you're a creative person, you know, you don't just invent, you've read other people. If you're a musician, you listen to other people. If you're an architect, you go look at other things uh, and allow that to become kind of part of your work. And you know, that's, that's a really important part of a practice, essentially. <laughs> well, I'm just like the individual genius. It's just, oh, I had to say that today. And that's what was amazing about our collaboration, although tricky because the press um, wouldn't, couldn't acknowledge, because Halloran Yoon are the architects of record, it was like Halloran Yoon's memorial, but actually it was the uh, uh, five of us together, uh, six of us together really, so it's very hard to point to one part of the project and say, I did that, because it was such a kind of hive mind in terms of how we worked on everything, including Frank, who's not an architect, but was so integral to how we were thinking about, about the project. <laughs>